Um, hi, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. I know that uh, this has been a long afternoon. Um, I have a slightly different uh, way I'm going to try to explain what my research is. Um, and that is to give you pointers to some papers and talks with, with relevant work. So I don't have slides. Um, I have a lot of material on my website and I'm just going to help take you through some of that. So um, my name is Aditya Ramdas. I'm jointly appointed in Department of Statistics and Data Science uh, and the Machine Learning Department. And I you know, currently co-advise uh, students and postdocs in, in both departments. Um, um, my research themes, I have uh, several of them. I'll, I'll go to the one that's most relevant, I think, to machine learning uh, people. And that's what I call um, assumption-free um, quantification of uncertainty. So uh, ML um, has developed lo lots of you know, interesting black box models over the last few decades. So boosting random forests, deep nets, and so on. Um, and uh, most of these have been uh, developed for making point predictions, which means that you, on, on a new point, uh, you, you produce a single label. Um, it could be classification or regression, but you produce one label, and and um, and I and you know to try and minimize some kind of an error. But I think in practice, when you deploy these models, it's uh, it's often uh, more valuable to produce not just a point prediction, but also uh, quantify the uncertainty in uh, in some way. Now, um, I am most interested in what's called distribution-free or assumption-free uncertainty quantification. And what that means is that um, I do not want to assume that we know anything about the distribution from which the data is coming. So I don't like, so if you have some labeled points, X, I, Y, I coming from some joint distribution, P, X, Y, I don't want to make any assumptions about P, X, Y. Some, you know, anything about the marginal distribution of X or the distribution of Y given X. I, I don't want to make some Lipschitz-ness, some smoothness, some, uh, you know, tail assumptions, you know, nothing like that. So I want the methods to be distribution free or what we call also assumption free. Uh, so they should apply to all distributions. Um, and I don't want the methods to be tuned to any particular algorithm. So uh, these are what are called wrapper methods. They, uh, you can choose your own favorite you know, ML algorithm, uh, you know, it could be, uh, I don't know, a, a deep net and, uh, or a random forest and, and, um, and you can choose your own data set that you want to try it out on. And this kind of a wrapper method takes in an algorithm and takes in a data set and it, it wraps around them and it produces, uh, instead of producing a point prediction, produces a confidence set or a prediction set actually for, for, the, for the new point that you want to make a prediction on. So instead of producing just a point, it says with probability at least one minus alpha with no assumptions on the algorithm or on the, on the data, the new point yn plus one will lie in this prediction set. So that obviously you know, involves uh, developing new, um, I, I guess new theoretical tools for how do we quantify uncertainty in this kind of uh, you know, agnostic, way that's also adaptive it's it's adaptive in the sense of if your distribution was simpler and your algorithm was well suited to your distribution these prediction sets will be smaller and if the problem is inherently very hard which means maybe it's it's a very hard prediction problem or your model was really not suit your you know your regression algorithm or whatever was not suited to the distribution then the prediction sets will be wider so it automatically adapts so you know how do we develop these kinds of methods? How do we think about them? And so that's an area that I've been working on for um, a few years now uh, with collaborators. So uh, this is kind of in reverse chronological, or, well, yeah, reverse chrono chronological order on the on my website. And and so you can see, so I, I often publish about half my work in exactly half my work in ML conferences and half my work in uh, statistics or um, uh, information theory journals. And um, and so early, I started I started this work with with a few collaborators, and and now uh, Chirag Gupta is uh, one of my uh, PhD students, who's a third year student in uh, MLD, and and so we have some recently submitted work uh, on this. Uh, so if you're interested, so that's uh, I mean uh, the early works were on reg regression, so the ones that are published were on regression algorithms. How do we quantify uncertainty? you know, non-asymptotically, in a frequentist fashion, no uh, Bayesian assumptions about some prior being correctly specified, uh, you know, no algorithmic assumptions. So that was for the regression context. Um, and uh, more recently, we have started to ask questions about, uh, you know, classification as well. And there's multiple different notions of how do you quantify uncertainty for classification? I think there, 
um, they're interesting. So we try, you know, we have this, I call this the tripod paper. It connects these three notions, prediction sets, confidence intervals, and calibration for classification. Um, uh, each of them is a slightly different way of quantifying uncertainty um, with a different interpretation. Um, ultimately, like the main contribution of this paper is a distribution free way of uh, providing calibration, post hoc calibration. So you have your own classifier that you've trained. Now I'm going to wrap around it and make that classifier produce calibrated predictions. And for those who don't know what calibrated predictions are, I'll just give you a very brief uh, insight or intuition. Um, uh, it's, you know, the, the idea of calibration comes from weather uh, prediction. It came from meteorolo uh, meteorologists, uh, I don't know how to say that word, but um, uh, the people who were doing climate predictions in the 70s and 60s and so on. And so what they wanted to do was they wanted to quantify when you make a prediction that tomorrow there's a 40% chance of rain, what does that mean that, you know, to, either it rains or it didn't rain. And then you say the next day, hey, there's a 10% chance of rain. What does that mean? Like it either drained or it didn't rain. So the notion of calibration is you, you know, you go to the end of the year and you look back and you look at all the days that you said 10% chance of rain. Maybe there are 20 such days. And if it rained about two of those 20 days, then you were calibrated. If it rained about 10 of those 20 days, then you're not calibrated because you said 10% chance of rain 20 times, but it rained like 50% of those times. So you were not calibrated. So for every P, if I go back and check what are the days I said there was a P percent chance of rain. And if I look at the empirical distribution of how many days did it rain? If I if it was about so on the days that I said 0.3%, 30% chance of rain, if it rained on 30% of those days, then I'm calibrated. And so uh, you can use the same thing for uh, same idea for classification algorithms that produce probabilistic classifications. And so otherwise, probabilistic classifiers just produce numbers between zero and one. These are not probabilities in any sense, typically. So 0.2 doesn't mean anything in a probabilistic sense. They're just a num it's just a number between zero and one. If you want to interpret it probabilistically, then it has to be calibrated. And so these are wrapper methods that work for kind of any distribution and any classification algorithm. They wrap around and produce post hoc calibrated, uh, uh, you know, uh, numbers between zero and one. Um, so yeah, so I'm still interested in, in, in this area. I think there's much more work to be done. Um, and it's, I think it's a very exciting area because uh, I don't think in practice it's realistic to make distributional assumptions or design algorithms that are very specific to one way of predicting or one way of classifying. We want kind of general wrapper algorithms that allows the user to you know, pick whatever algorithm they think is suitable for their data set and just kind of wrap around it. And so, um, so anyway, so that's one area. If you're interested in it, there's, you know, several papers that you can link to. Some of them are on just on archive. Some of them are in published, but you know, everything's on archive. Um, if you are more interested, then I've given a one hour kind of tutorial talk for this that kind of develops it from scratch. And, you know, you can listen to it. And if you find it interesting, then, um, then you can reach out to me. Um, I'll briefly tell you about areas that may be potentially less interesting uh, to people in the machine learning department, but uh, you know who knows. Uh, one area that I am been committed to for a long time now is using machine learning for hypothesis testing. So uh, um, if you work with uh, scientists, so people in genetics and neuroscience and, uh, and other areas, they often are you know testing hypotheses and so you know an example of a hypothesis you might test or actually they often test tens of thousands of hypotheses would be is this part of the genome or is this snip in the genome is this associated with a particular disease like crohn's disease and so the, uh, there's a formal hypothesis test that you would try to perform and you would do this for every location on the genome now that gives you tens of thousands of uh, hypotheses that you want to test. And the, the goal is to try and identify some subset of the genome perhaps that might be associated with the disease. Now, uh, like machine learning algorithms are extremely powerful. And uh, the question, broad question I have been interested in is, what is the right way to use generic black box machine learning algorithms that usually, you know, are good at prediction, but don't have any, you know, hypothesis testing kind of guarantees. They don't come with those kind of guarantees. How do you use them for the purpose of hypothesis testing? So in the end, I, I still want, you know, you know, valid p-values, valid confidence intervals for some treatment effects, you know, things of that kind. 
but i want to be able to rely on the powerful prediction algorithms to to give me that and so uh, so these are you know generally a, a variety of works which are kind of broadly motivated by that, that theme and so i mean just to take one example these top two works con- consider the problem of conditional independence testing which is um you know one of the building blocks in causal inference and um, and and what you want to know is you want to test a you want to test when you're testing conditional independence what you're saying is that i think that the disease y is independent of the snp x1 given all of the other snps x2 till x30000 and that's the test that you want to run and now we're going to employ our ability our ability to predict y given x so basically we'll train regression algorithms from x to y and use the quality of these prediction algorithms to come up with a way of quantifying exactly the what the uh, estimated treatment effect is or quantify a p value for that hypothesis test so um i, I mean usually people not people in ml you know may may not be Im- immediately familiar with hypothesis testing but in your first semester when you take a 705 class hopefully you'll you'll get familiar with some of the basics at least and um if you work in the sciences you will definitely come across plenty of hypothesis testing if you work in tech you'll come across less less of that um so again some as you can see some of this is um you know published in statistics venues some of them are, are in uh, you know ml venues and um you know so, so some you know for example this work is about how do you use multi armed bandits which usually are thought of in terms of regret minimization or best arm identification but how do you use it for testing hypotheses so how, we want to uh, think of a, a clinical trial in which there are uh, there's one control arm and there's k treatment arms and your interest is to identify uh you to test is there any treatment that is better than the control your null hypothesis is that every treatment is basically as good as a placebo and your alternative is that it, there's at least one treatment that's better than the placebo and uh, what you want to do is as people come into the clinical trial you want to assign them adaptively to treatment or control but as some treatments start to look better than others you want to assign more people to the good treatments and less people to the bad treatments and and at the end of it still be able to quantify your uncertainty and report a treatment effect or a p value for that hypothesis and so how do you adapt bandit ideas for for testing in sequential settings um so that's kind of another broad theme that i work on which might be of interest um uh, two other uh, areas which i've not talked about are sequential inference just uh, this is a problem of using martingales for quantifying uncertainty when data is arriving sequentially um if you're interested in concentration inequalities and sequential analysis and you know things of that kind for gaussian processes bayesian optimization ab testing um you know all all of these uh, are are, are i don't know if you're interested in sequential problems you might find that uh, relevant um so that's the research themes each of them has a little you know little blurb on the top and some set of papers they all have talks uh, that you can you know go and listen to and see if you're actually interested in in, in any of this uh, a few things i'll point out uh, before finishing uh, i maintain a set of checklists for phd students uh these are really guidelines that i give my own phd students they really honestly for me to remember things that i want to tell my students and for my students to remember 6 months later what i what i actually told them but it's up on my website in case it's helpful to anybody else so these are just one page uh, blurbs about how do you give an effective uh, talk how do you write a paper how do you review papers how do you maintain your work life balance and uh how do you write rebuttals and just things of that nature so if you know some of you might be interested in in some of these um i'm involved with um, uh, one of the lead organizers of the statistical uh, machine learning reading group um this is a group that has about 10 to 15 faculty members across st- stats and ml and a couple from electrical engineering and a couple from you know math and a couple from the tepper school of business and so on but primarily stat and ml it's a joint reading group that's been active for 10 plus years uh, where each week a different person presents a different uh, paper i mean a theoretically oriented paper uh, typically uh, so if you're interested in the stat ml reading group you can you know check out that website over there um uh, other links i mean these are courses i've taught in the past uh, uh, that that you can find out more about and some workshops that are organized so um 
as I said, I don't have slides, but I think there's, if you want to know about my research or things I've been interested in recently and you know so on, the, hopefully uh, you'll find my website easy enough to navigate. So I'll uh, stop there, maybe see if there's a, you know, one or two clarification questions before handing it off.